Well, good morning. Good morning. So this morning I want to talk a little bit about what makes you a Christian. What, in the grand scheme of things, what ultimately is a Christian? Is it this building? If you're inside it, you're a Christian. Is that what it is? No. Does the Apostle Paul make you a Christian? No. Does Eddie and Bob getting together to give you a blessing, do they make you a Christian? No. Ultimately, what it is that makes us a Christian is the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. It's Christ's blood that covers our sins, that allows us to be Christian. Through this blood, we are freed from the captivity of sin. And so that is what gives us our identity. That's who we are. We're Christians. But before Christ, in Judaism, if you were a Jew, what gave you your identity? Even Jews today, what gives them their identity? It's certainly not Jesus Christ. Their identity is found in the story of Moses and the story of the Passover where God lead, leads his people out of <laughs> captivity in Egypt into the promised land. Well, for Christians in the New Testament, our climax story is Jesus Christ on the cross taking away our sins. In the Old Testament, it's Moses and the Passover. And because Moses and the Passover is such a central theme to Judaism, and throughout all of Scripture, it's important that we take a moment and we look at the Passover. And so, if you would, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 is where we find Moses and Aaron talking with God. There has now been nine plagues on the Egyptian people. This is, we looked at last week how we have this ultimate battle going on between Pharaoh, who is the undisputed ruler of the world, and God, the undisputed creator of the world. And we see this battle going on. And we looked at many of the plagues last week, but we get to this climactic event in chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 1 through 14, and then we're going to skip down to uh, verses 21 and read 21 through 32. And so Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. And when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel gathers, they shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in raw water, but roasted its head and its legs and its entrails. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. 
with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And then drop down to verse 21. And then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select the lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statue for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will pro promise you, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's pastor. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt. When he struck the Egyptians, but he spared our houses. And the people, they bowed their heads and they worshipped. And then the people of Israel went and did so. And the Lord, all that the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants and the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there were not, was not a house where someone was not dead. And then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both of you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord. As you have said, take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. This is the Jewish Easter. When God enters into history and takes his firstborn Israel and delivers them from captivity. They're being liberated from Egypt. And this is why they're celebrating. And not just then, but they're to do it every year to remember God's salvation, God freeing them from captivity. Even to this day, Jewish families will gather around on Passover, and it's the custom the youngest child is to look at the father and say, Dad, what does this mean? Why are we doing this? And the Father retails this redemptive action of God rescuing the Jewish people. It's a way that they continue to be a part of that tradition. They continue to see that salvific work of God. But here's what I want you to think about. What are they celebrating? What is the blood on the doorposts doing? What's it saving them from? Just remember, just imagine this. You get this command by your leader and you're a slave. You've been a slave your whole life. Your people's been in slavery for 400 years. And your leader says, 
start hearing screams of people out in Egypt that are dying. The fear and terror that's going on outside of your home, you're hearing that screaming. All the firstborn sons, all the animals, they're dying around you. And yet you're here celebrating this feast. How can one possibly celebrate the death of all those Egyptians? Sure, they certainly weren't best friends with each other, okay? I get it. But how can you celebrate when all those people are dying? This is one of those passages that make people look at this passage and they say, I can't worship that God of the Old Testament. That's a God of wrath going to kill all these people. I worship the God of the New Testament. And that... You know, it's a real struggle at times as you listen to this story and you recognize all the destruction that is going on. How can we look at this story and say, yes, this is my God? And yet this is the God of all of Scripture. Throughout all of the story, we see this. We see it in Adam and Eve. We see it in the Passover. We look at the Jewish Day of Atonement, which we'll look at in the next week or two weeks from now. We look at the Day of Atonement. We look at Christ's death. And the theme is all the same. What is God saving the people from? God is saving us from the wrath of God. It is a salvation that is by God, but it's also a salvation that is from God. We're escaping this wrath of God. Here in Exodus especially, we see both sides of the one true God. We see the God of wrath, but we also see the God of redemption. Here in Exodus, we see the real nature of what divine judgment is. Divine judgment has two sides. There's a side of mercy and there's a side of wrath. And it's on full display in the Passover story. And I bring this up, I point this out because in 21st century American Christianity, we don't like this portrait of God. Uh, in reality, I think most churches will either pick one God or the other. We, we want the hellfire and brimstone God, or we want the God of love that allows anything and everyone and would it possibly destroy anybody. We want one of those two gods, and usually we err on the side of the God of love that won't destroy anybody. But that's not what we see here in this story. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, we see that this is the portrait of God. He is a wrathful God and a loving God. And as much as we might want to, we cannot divorce these two gods from each other. And so I want to think about a few things here. What would happen if a family, a Jewish family, was told, go put the blood out there? And they chose not to do it. Well, they're still Jewish, right? So certainly God would save them, right? No. Because they chose not to submit to the Word of God. They took it upon themselves and said, No, we don't need to submit to God. He'll pass by us regardless. He loves us. We're His chosen people. They chose not to cover themselves with the blood of the Lamb. And so they chose God's wrath, even when God's mercy was available. And we see that today. God's mercy is available to all people. But do you choose to cover yourself with the blood of the Lamb, or do you choose not to? Do you choose the God of mercy, or do you end up with that God of wrath? That is the question. And so we get into the New Testament, and the Passover is still being celebrated in 
Passover as well. And I want to read one story about Jesus and the Passover. It comes from Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 17. When on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And so the disciples did just as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of its fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. Jesus is our Passover lamb. His blood covers us. His blood protects us. Jesus is our salvation by God, and Jesus is our salvation from the wrath of God. And Egypt experienced the wrath of God. The firstborns were all dying around them, and Israel was passed by. Jesus, God's firstborn, his beloved son, did not pass by the plague of death. Jesus experienced the wrath of God when he took upon himself our sins. An unblemished lamb took upon our sins and experienced the wrath of God and the destruction of God on the cross so that, he, so that God could pass over each of us that allows ourselves to be covered with the blood of the Lamb. And the Passover feast was instituted as an annual observance so that each year, even thousands of years since, new generations will be able to participate in that saving act. Yes, the act was once for all time, but we have this annual remembrance of what happened. Just as Christ dying was once for all time, and yet he institutes on the night of Passover, he institutes the Lord's Supper. That each time we gather together and each time we partake in it, we participate in that salvific work just as the Jews did for Passover. We do with Christ as a remembrance of all generations of what happened. And so the question becomes, no, we'll do that later. Because of the Passover, the Israelites, they became a new nation. They became a new creation. <clears throat> no longer are they in bondage and just the people. Now they're in the promised land. Now they're a nation of their own. Instead of being subject to the Egyptian calendar, they have a new calendar and a new year. Just as when we are buried with Christ in baptism and, God's, and Christ's blood covers us, we are raised in newness of life. And so that brings me back to the question about celebrating as the world outside is screaming and dying. Why is it that, I don't know, it seems like in America today, Christianity today, we don't seem to think that the judgment day will actually ever come. It's been 2,000 years Christ hasn't returned. 
And yet we have evidence from the story of accidents that at some point God will enter into history and he will destroy those that do not obey him and save those that do. We see it in Exodus and yet we don't have that mentality of hurry up, let's be prepared, be prepared. Maybe we should have that a little bit more. Well, we should celebrate our salvation through Jesus Christ. We should also mourn those that do not have that salvation. We should mourn that, but we should do more than just mourn. We should be reaching out. We should be taking the word of God to them, taking the love of Christ to them so that they too can come under the protection of the blood of the Lamb and enjoy and celebrate with us in their salvation as well. Because all they have to do is the same thing that every Christian has to do, the same thing that every Jew on the day of the original Passover had to do. All they have to do is submit to the Word of God and allow themselves to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you so much for your salvific work. Thank you so much for entering into human history as you did. On the day of Passover, you entered into human history to save your chosen people. And then 2,000 years later, you did it again when you came in the bodily form of Christ and entered into history to save your chosen people. Lord God, as we look back on that time, thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. And we ask you to be with each and every one of us as we go throughout the world and let's try to bring your message of salvation, your message of love to the world so more people can celebrate that action of you entering into human history. And Lord, let us remember this each and every Sunday as we participate in the Lord's Supper, that we are doing it as a memorial to you, Lord. But every time we do it, it cannot become old hat. It has to continue to stay fresh as a remembrance of what you've done for us, Lord. In Christ Jesus, we pray and we ask these things and we thank you for allowing the Lamb's blood to cover us. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.